Well, I want to thank uh, the whole Low Carb Down Under crew and and Rod for inviting me. And I really want to give kudos to the uh, to the AV team over here. I've been down here 15 times with my slides. I screwed them up one after another, and they managed to salvage them and fix it. So anyway, when uh, when I agreed to give this talk, Rob said, uh, Rod said, what do you want to talk about? And I said, I don't know, I'll figure something out. The next thing I know, I was on the schedule for fat, protein, and carbohydrates. <laughs> so, so I ended up uh, kind of changing that to incretins, insulin, and processed food. So that's what we'll be talking about today. How many of you know what incretins are? A few, a handful of people, good. Well, as we all know, uh, processed foods are much in the news lately. That's kind of the new bogeyman. And this is an article that just appeared in The Guardian, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. And it, it was an expert panel uh, that had made commentary on this. And The Guardian pointed out that three of the five scientists on the panel were in, in the employ of the processed food industry. And they were had positions with Nestle's, Mondelez, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Unilever, and General Mills. And the lady that kind of headed the thing, Dr. Janet Cade, uh, she uh, is chair of an advisory committee, and their members include all of these people, all of whom make high processed foods. And this is a, uh, this is a paper from Kevin Hall, who's Mr. Kaiko, calories in, calories out guy. And he is even into the ultra processed food thing. And, and this study that he did showed that uh, uh, ultra processed foods uh, compared to unprocessed foods, people gained a lot more weight and ate a lot more with them. And he also showed that uh, even though the glucose was about the same, that the uh, insulin was a little bit higher and you would think it would be a lot higher in uh, highly processed foods until you read in the, the article and it said an ultra processed breakfast might consist of a bagel with cream cheese and turkey bacon, while the unprocessed breakfast was oatmeal with bananas, walnuts. And doesn't seem like a real big difference to me. And as it, indicated on the slide, it, it, uh, it really isn't. So ultra processed foods, let's talk about those. Is that a bad thing, ultra processed foods? Or is that just another thing like some of the other things we've seen to be fat, artery clogging, saturated fat. Has anybody ever heard that phrase before? Only about 50 million times. Every time they mention they can't use saturated fat in an article, it's always artery clogging saturated fat. It's got to have those adjectives on it. So are ultra processed foods just another thing like that or are ultra processed foods really bad? And that's what we're gonna take a look at today. Now. This is a, a medical or a scientific article that my wife and I wrote with Lauren Cordain, God, I don't know, 20 years ago. And in it, we mentioned uh, uh, glucose-dependent uh, insulinotropic polypeptide or peptide and glucagon-like peptide uh, one. And we wrote that back then, and I hadn't really thought about it much. And then lately, I got to thinking about it more. Uh, and, and GLP-1 we all know about because GLP-1 are these new weight loss drugs, glucagon-like peptide. And glucagon-like peptide uh, has some benefits. It increases insulin sensitivity. And if you look in the lower right, it increases insulin secretion and decreases glucagon secretion, which is good for people who have diabetes. And so that's why they've been using these to treat people with diabetics because it bumps up their insulin level. And that's a GLP-1. And they found out along the way that if, if you could uh, um, antagonize the receptors for these things, good things would happen in terms of weight loss. And so Ozempic now has become the leading uh, anti-diabetic drug in the United States with 375 prescriptions a week. And I guarantee you most of them are not for diabetes, they're probably for weight loss because everybody wants to get these. These are injectable, it's 1.2 milligrams a week injected and people are losing pretty significant amounts of weight with it. 
And here is another one, uh, semaglutide or semaglutide, people pronounce it differently. This is 2.4, and this is Wagovi, the big weight loss drug now. And people get this once a week and they lose a lot of weight. And I mean a substantial amount of weight. And this is what it looks like. This is the weight loss curve. And it really looks good. It looks uh, like a really good low carb diet, but you don't have to go on low carb to do this. And the, the danger sign you see is down here around week 60, it kind of levels out and it starts going back up. And that's what you see typically in weight loss studies that are published. You see people lose and they turn around and start going back up a little bit. So we don't know what's going to happen there on people who stay on this drug. And we don't know what the long-term effects are. It's not approved for long-term use. And you just can't put people on these drugs for life, although the drug companies are wanting to, because they say, well, obesity is a disease like high blood pressure. You don't put people on high blood pressure medicine for six months and then take them off. So if they're obese, you need to keep them on drugs forever. But we do not know what the long-term effects of these drugs are. And what we do know is that if you go off of them, uh, you can see the placebo is about the same, but if you go off of these drugs, people regain all their weight, just like they do when they go off of a diet. So I, uh, my prediction is that these things are, are not gonna have a good outcome long time, and we're gonna see lots of problems with them. Uh, and if you look at the composition of the weight that's lost on these, it's really distressing. Now, the paper that I just showed, the New England Journal paper, they have a supplement that comes with it that you have to download separately. It doesn't come with the article, and it's a PDF file. And when you look at this, they've isolated out 140 people in this, in this group of subjects that they used. And I don't know what the criterion was for isolating these people, but when they did, they found out that they lost on an average of 36.33 pounds uh, over the course of taking their, their medication. And of that weight loss, 15.22 pounds was lean body mass. And that's a 42% loss of lean body mass. That's pretty substantial. The other speakers were talking about this. Uh, you do not want to lose lean body mass. This is a thing that I'm just absolutely passionate about. Uh, lean body mass is like money in the bank. When you, you can maintain lean body mass up to about age 30 by doing nothing. Uh, your lean body mass is under hormonal control um, and, and you can eat crap and it'll extract the proteins out and you're gonna maintain your lean body mass and you can even build lean body mass. Once you're past age 30, circa age 30, it goes in the other direction. There's a whole different system that involves mTOR that is used to maintain and build lean body mass. And you've got to have, in order to, to make mTOR work, you've got to have a fair amount of leucine. Leucine is in high quantities and, and food of animal origin. It's not in quantities really at all much in foods of plant origin. So leucine is really important. And not only that, you've got to have a lot of it to build that, and you've got to combine it with resistance exercise. When the, so when these people are losing their lean body mass on Wagovi and Ozempic, they're really doing themselves some damage because they're not going to be able to easily regain that. And when they regain this weight, they're going to regain fat weight and have a lower lean body mass, a lower metabolic rate, more difficulty losing weight the next time, and they're going to be in much worse shape than they are which is giving rise to all these articles about Ozempic face, you know, where their faces go down. I Googled this, and that was just a little strip across. There are a million pictures in there if you want to Google this to see. And there's Wagovi butt, the same thing. <laughs> so, so people uh, are, are already suffering some of the ill effects of this loss of lean body mass, but it's really important to maintain the lean body mass. And that's my big worry about this. Now, this is a 40-year-old triathlete. This is a cross-section of the thigh, and you can see the muscle mass there. This is a 70-year-old sedentary man, and you can see the loss of muscle mass and the replacement with fat. But it does not have to be this way. If you eat animal foods, foods of animal origin, get plenty of leucine, and you do resistance training, you can end up looking like this, which is a 70-year-old triathlete. So it looks the same as the 40-year-old. As the so it's not impossible to maintain your lean body mass, but you've got to work at it, and you don't want to sacrifice it by going on a crappy diet or taking Wagovi. And when people take Wagovi, they don't eat. There's a, a, the snack companies are all up in arms. This was a, an article just last week <laughs> in the Wall Street Journal. 
<laughs> about all the snack companies are worried because people aren't snacking because they're going on Wagovia and Ozempic. And if you think about it, you know, there's a lesson in there. If the snack foods are going down, I mean, that's what kept these people fat probably because they're eating a lot of snack foods. And the guy that's the head of ConAgra says snacking tends to be one of the most profitable businesses in food and among the fastest growing. But the S&P 500 packaged food and meat sub-index has dropped 14% since the onset of these things. Again, there's a lesson in there. And this is the problem. It says that patients are likely to better tolerate low-fat and fiber-rich staple foods. They have trouble with fat when they're on these drugs. It makes them sick. They get nauseated. There are a lot of side effects to these drugs. And so they're going on even lower protein. They're not eating very much. They're having this huge muscle mass loss. So anyway, I'm going to get off my soapbox about that. But that's just a thing I'm really uh, uh, passionate about. Now, GIP is the other in Cretan. That's the one we're going to talk about today because it's one that uh, is really kind of a, a, a bad guy in many ways. It, uh, does the, it, it also increases insulin secretion just like GLP-1, but it also increases glucagon secretion, which is why you don't want to use it for weight loss. And because of that, well, they've looked at everything trying to figure out how to, how to make this a weight loss drug because GLP-1 was so good. And, and they can't find a way to do it because everything that they look at, it says this is going to make you gain weight. But the people that did Monjaro, the latest one, Trizepatide, has got the best weight loss profile of all. And it's a combination of GLP-1 and GIP receptor uh, agonists. And so the... Um, Anyway, there's something in there. They haven't figured it out, but they're throwing zillions of dollars at it now to try to figure out what in GIP helps people lose weight. But it increases lipogenesis, it increases uh, adipose tissue. One of the good things it does is bone formation that the previous speaker talked about. And so when GIP's up, it makes you form bone more, and you think, well, gosh, that's good. Maybe you should really drive your GIP up. Well, you do with protein and you do with fat, and that helps with, with uh, increasing bone mass or maintaining bone mass. And if you notice that people who go on hyperal or total parental uh, nutrition, TPN, where they're getting fed intravenously, when they do that, they lose bone mass. That's a big problem with that, is trying to maintain bone mass. Because in order to stimulate these things, you've got to, uh, you've got to take food orally. And this is just a newer, that was an old slide. This is a newer, from an older journal, this is a newer slide. It shows basically this, uh, they're looking at, uh, is it going to decrease caloric intake? That's the main thing everybody's concentrating on. But it's the same thing, increase insulin, increase glucagon, uh, increases glucose uptake and fat storage and the meal-associated bone remodeling. So what, what is GIP and GLP-1? These are called incretins. They are formed in these cells, K cells in the case of GIP and L cells. that are lower down in the GI tract in the case of GPL-1. And these are little kind of almost endocrine cells lining the, the wall of the, of the gut. And they came about, people think, because the pancreas used to be in cells inside the lining of the gut but because they were open to the outside, basically, because your gut is open to the outside, that they were prone to toxic insult if people or animals ate the wrong thing. And so the theory is that over time they migrated and became the pancreas, so they were removed from there. But in order to get the signaling, these little cells are still in there, in the K cells uh, and the L cells. And this, this, these hormones that they secrete stimulate what's called the enteroinsular axis. Now, what is this all about? Here we go. This is the, we're going to talk about the incretin effect, and the incretin effect is primarily driven by GIP, which is the one we're going to spend most of our time talking about today. Now, this was done, this work was done back in the, actually in the 1960s, the original work at the University of Colorado, and they gave people oral glucose tolerance tests, which looked just like that. And then they duplicated it with IV glucose. So they gave them IV glucose to mimic what happened in the blood when people took glucose orally. And then they looked at what happened with insulin. And what ended up happening is with insulin and IV glucose, if you give people IV glucose, there's just a barely little bump in insulin. It's a tiny, tiny effect. 
even though they've got extra sugar in their blood, there's a tiny effect. If you look at insulin with an oral glucose tolerance test, if you look at that, that's called the incretin effect. That's the effect that you get the increased effect if you take the glucose orally. Okay, there's a huge difference. And that's because of these, the GIP. And that's called the incretin effect. And that's just another picture of the, of the IV glucose, exactly the same, but a huge difference in insulin. Okay, and this is a, a drug, it's not a drug, it's, it's what they use in experiments now uh, to look at this. And this is sucrose, which is a table sugar, and that's a combination of one molecule of glucose and one of fructose, but it's hooked together differently than isomaltulose, which is another two, uh, two sugar, sugar like sucrose. It's also glucose and fructose, but hooked together differently. And it's broken down differently. It's broken down way on down the GI tract instead of up front. So the glucose is released later. And what you see is you see a big increase in insulin and you see a big increase in GIP when you give subjects um, this, when you, when you give them uh, isomaltitose versus sucrose. Now, this is a study that was done by Gerald Rebin uh, and, and uh, Golay a long time ago, back in the 80s, and they looked at, uh, at white beans, and they looked at the cells of white beans uh, in a, under an electron microscope, and you can see on the left that these are undamaged cells, and if you look on the right, the cells have been damaged because the beans have been processed. And what they looked at is if you look at the plasma glucose on this 50 grams, there's very little difference. But if you look at the insulin, there's a huge difference in insulin response because the integrity of the cells are broken down, which is what happens with processed foods. Here's another study done some years back that is really interesting. They took subjects that were used as their own controls and they gave them apples in what's called slow puree and fast puree, which is another name for applesauce. And they gave them apple juice, slow and fast. They gave them, I can't remember how many, about a pound of apples to eat. And these subjects ate the apples. And then they measured their insulin and their glucose. And then they gave them an equivalent amount of applesauce, an equivalent amount of apple juice. And then they gave, they, they timed them eating the apples. And so the fast one, they just threw it back. The slow ones, they spread out the time that they took to eat the, the, the puree or drink the apple juice to be equivalent to the time it took them to actually eat the apples. And what you find out when, you, when they did this, oh, and instantly the, the, the glycemic index of apples and apple juice are essentially the same. They're not very different, which is one of the reasons that I hate the glycemic index and I always go on a jihad about it every chance I get because there's got to be a better way to do this. But anyway, the, they're essentially got the same. You can see up there with that blue smudge, they all have essentially the, the same glucose response. But if you look over here, you see a big difference in the insulin response. And you see the top insulin response is the most processed, which is the apple juice, and the least is the apple itself. So the more processing, the more GIP picks this up, and the more it runs your insulin up. So if you believe, as I do, that one of the measures of your lifetime health is your area under the insulin curve, you're better off eating unprocessed foods than your processed foods. Now here's another one. This is just particle size. You've got uh, fine flour, coarse flour, cracked grain, and whole grain. If you look on the left, you've got about the same glucose response if you eat those. If you look on the right, a big difference in insulin response. Uh, and there's the area under the insulin curve. This is another uh, interesting study because people were thinking, well, maybe it's the fiber that does this. It doesn't have anything to do with the the actual food itself, the structural properties of the food, but it's the fiber content. So they took wheat bread, uh, whole kernel rye, and then they ground up the whole kernel rye and got rid of all the, the junk that's in that and replaced it with beta-glucan, which is a soluble fiber and made that beta-glucan rye. And then the bottom one is a wholemeal pasta. And what they found out is that you see that the wheat bread is the highest, but the beta-glucan is the next highest, and way down close to the bottom is the actual rye. And you can see that the, the GIP, I put GLP one down, but the GIP is high at that, and the insulin is, is really high. So it's the structural component of the food, and that's what they say, the structural and compositional properties of the fiber, uh, 
play more of a role in the regulation than does the amount of fiber. So breaking the, the food down, processing it, is what's worrisome. And here's a, a, a slide of the fiber consumption, which has nothing to do, and those are the war years, but this is the fiber consumption in the U.S. since 1909. And you can see that it's gone down, but it's not a function of the fiber. Fiber is kind of a surrogate for food processing. So the lower the fiber you find, the more the food is processed, and you can see that our processed food is really going up. Now, what does GIP do with lipids? If you, if you look at that, you've got oral lipids and intravenous lipids. So you sort of see the same thing on the left. And then you look at the glucose curve on the right, and you look at the uh, fatty acid curve, but you get over here and you look at the GIP, and it really bumps up with oral lipids. And if you look at uh, uh, the GLP when it goes up to, we're not too concerned about that, but the GIP really goes up with oral lipids. And insulin also goes up, and you can see that, and you can see that glucagon goes up too. Why would that be? The reason glucagon goes up is that if you're taking in lipids, you're not taking in any glucose. And so if the insulin goes up, you're going to drop your glucose a little bit. If you drop the glucose, you're going to become hypoglycemic from taking in just pure fat. And so uh, the, the GIP makes you run up your glucagon a little bit to compensate for that so your blood sugar stays where it should be. Uh, it's, it's the same exact thing with protein. Uh, insulin bumps up with protein. Uh, this is fat and protein and, and water so that you can see the difference. And again, GIP, you can see the, the circles, the, not the black and one, but the other ones, that the protein drives the GIP up and it also drives the glucagon up for the same reason because it takes a while to convert the dietary protein to sugar via gluconeogenesis and you're eating it, so it drives up your insulin, drives down the, the, the blood sugar, and so you compensate with the glucagon. Now, this is a, a really interesting study. I almost hate to go through it because it's kind of complicated. But this is a, a six obese guys who were really obese and they were fasted for three weeks and they had an average weight loss of almost 11 kilograms, which is really pretty substantial. And then they took them and, and they did this both before and after their weight loss. And before the weight loss, they put them on, uh, in one experiment, they put them on IV glucose and then they gave them oral triglycerides, which was a suspension of blah, corn oil. And they gave them that, and they wanted to see what was going to happen. And when they gave them this, they found out on the top left slide that the glucose uh, is high, which you would think because they're getting IV glucose. Their blood glucose is going to be high. Uh, but also, if you look at the IV glucose plus the oral fat when they gave them that, that was pretty high too. I mean, that ran their glucose up as well. And if you look at insulin, the highest insulin is with the, uh, the glucose and the, the fat. And if you think about this, try to think of a food in nature that has both fat and sugar in it. It's hard to do. What? What? Yeah, milk's, yeah, milk's got a little bit, yeah. But a food for adults, it's hard to think of one. You can, you can find, yeah, nuts have some, but they don't have a lot of sugar in them, but you have, or a lot of carb in them, but you have, uh, uh, you know, fat and protein come together, but you usually don't see carb and fat together. And what this shows is that if you eat the carb and fat together, and what are processed foods, by and large, carbohydrate and fat, that you get the, the worst insulin response at all. And you can see on the right how all this is, it's not really blunted. I would say that's more normal because they've lost weight. It's unblunted on the left because they're really metabolically broken there. And if you look at the incretin response to mixed meals, I don't like this study particularly because it's done with a, uh, with a glucose clamp or an insulin clamp, but it's, uh, uh, it shows you, uh, they gave these people a sandwich made with, with bread and butter and dried meat, yum. And then, <laughs> and, the, and then they broke it out and gave them just the butter and they gave them just the dried meat. And so the top, because they're on a clamp, doesn't make sense. But if you look at the bottom, uh, you can see that the insulin went up with the mixed meal, went up a little bit with the butter and, and very little with the, uh, with the dried meat. And you can see the GIP response was really larger with the mixed meal. And this is one of my favorite studies, and this is a, a caveat whenever you're looking at 
at rodent studies. It's probably like this on humans too. It would just take a lot longer to do it on humans, but these are mouse studies. And what they did was they gave these mice a chow diet. Remember, you can go to, to you know, man, research, I mean, uh, scientific stores or, or places that academics go to and buy all these different chows. So if you want a Western diet chow, you can get it. If you want a high fat chow, you can get it. So these are all chows. So it all comes in tablets. So they gave them a, a, a high fat diet, high fat chow, and they gave them the Western diet. And so if you look at this study, you would say, okay, well, it's pretty obvious that the low fat, uh, high carb diet works best to keep uh, rodents from gaining weight. But then the guys that did the study took the extra step and they took all these uh, tablets and they ground them up to where they were all a fine powder and they fed it. And when they did that, you got the chow diet and you got the high fat diet and you got the Western diet. They're all the same. And there's just that's the actual thing for the study. So, you know, I'm not making this up, uh, but but they were all the same. Now, let's look at, at meal timing a little bit. Uh, this is a study done where you take uh, they, they did three different things I mean, they had three different meals. They could have done this a lot differently. But anyway, they took with the carb, which is rice, the vegetables next and the meat last. Uh, the vegetables first, the carbs second, and the meat last, and the veggies first, the meat second, and the carbs last. And they wanted to look and see what kind of a response people would have to this. And what they found out was that the uh, the glucose was the lowest with the uh, you know with the the, the meat uh, in the middle, and the uh, and the same thing that the lowest one is the one with the carbs last, the meat in the middle, and the vegetables first. And this is another different study where they looked at ghrelin, which is a hormone that makes you hungry. And if you got the carbs first, you know, you got rid of your hunger, but it went up above the baseline and it stayed lower with the carbs last or with a sandwich. And so, you know, life is short. Do not eat dessert first. <laughs> And this is just a summary slide about what we know about GIP now, which is a little bit different because not only does it do the insulin secretion and the glucagon secretion, it actually decreases fat oxidation. Uh, it actually tends toward fatty liver by a couple of different pathways. And also it uh, decreases fat breakdown and it also encourages migration of macrophages into the fat cells and the release of all kinds of cytokines and increase in an inflammatory response. So ultra-processed foods, they're not in the same category with artery-clogging saturated fats. They really are pretty bad for you. So the take-home lesson from all this is uh, if, if you want to lose weight, don't eat, okay? If you, if you don't want to not eat, don't eat carbs. If you want to eat carbs, don't eat processed carbs. If you want to eat processed carbs, don't eat them first. And don't graze and eat fewer larger meals and mainly meat. And with that, I thank you very much.